This is Transmission Interrupted, the podcast series from NeedTech, the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Welcome to Transmission Interrupted from NeedTech. Hello, and welcome to Transmission Interrupted. My name is Jill Morgan. I'm a nurse here at Emory University Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. For those of you not yet familiar with NeTech, our mission is to set the gold standard for pathogen preparedness and response across health systems in the U.S. with the goals of driving best practices, closing knowledge gaps, and developing innovative resources. NeTech works alongside and in cooperation with the CDC and is funded by ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. On today's episode, I'm joined by two very knowledgeable physicians, Clayton Maurer and John Horton. Clayton is a board-certified internist, pediatrician, and adult ID physician who is currently at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, where he's a pediatric infectious disease fellow. Welcome, Clayton. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. And my friend John Horton is here today. He is the Division Director of General Obstetrics and Gynecology for Emory Healthcare. Horton has been working with us on all kinds of issues with pregnancy and high-consequence infectious diseases since the Ebola outbreak of 2014. Nice to have you with me today, Horton. Thank you. Nice to be here. We're going to talk a lot today about travel and travel precautions or preparedness for those who are pregnant, toting a newborn, or breastfeeding. But I know y'all field a lot of questions all day, every day. So I wanted to just start with some of the things that you answer all the time. John, what do you feel like is just a really common set of questions that you get that you know you have to have prepared answers for? Sure. I I do get a lot of questions when people are preparing to travel. And most of them center around, in the world of infectious disease, of who can be around my baby, who can I be around if I'm pregnant? Are there things that I need to think about from vaccination, as well as even food preparation, if I'm traveling to places where I'm unsure of the safety of either food or water, and sometimes even the environment, whether somebody's going camping or going to a lake or to the ocean versus going to a place where all of their meals will be prepared for them and they may not have the ability to see what's going in to the things that they'll be eating or drinking. And then even the environment from, hey, we're going to go into a cruise and we're going to be in high contact areas. How do I protect myself? What are the things I need to think about? And I think we're going to go through a lot of those answers as we travel through today's program. Excellent. Absolutely. So let's start there. Let's talk about travel preparation. What do people need to put together? What do people need to think about? And how far in advance do some of that prep need to happen? So I think when you start deciding on where you go, that's when you start preparing then you need to think, how are you going to get there? And depending on those two answers will help mold what your preparations need to be. How long will you be in a car? Are you traveling with other people who you're not normally around? Are you on a plane? Are you on a bus? Most travel scenarios will have some instances where you're going to be around a high volume number of people, especially in the travel portion of your trip and start thinking about how do you want to protect yourself? The first preparation is thinking about your comfort levels, especially when it comes to things like masking. I would generally recommend that if you're going to be in a scenario where you're going to be in contact with a lot of people, and by high contact, I mean within that six foot range. So you're going to be in crowded areas where you're at risk of catching sort of droplets or other conditions or even touching people if you're getting on and off of trains or transits to where do you have your hand sanitizer, be mindful of touching your face, and consider wearing a mask if that is something that you're comfortable with. I do think it will help protect you in really high volume areas. And Clayton, do you have any other advice as well? Yeah, I totally agree with everything that John said and wanted to echo all of that. I just wanted to emphasize the point of really starting to make those preparations whenever you know where you're going. Depending on where you're going and what you're doing, several things can take time, especially if you're traveling internationally and need vaccines and things like that. It's important to let your physician know as soon as possible so that you can have the time to get those vaccination series done. And you can also just plan for yourself any 
medications that you may need, any other sorts of supplies or anything, the sooner you start preparing for those, the better off you'll be when the time comes. Excellent. And, and I'm glad you mentioned getting in touch with your physician or, or thinking about that contact. Are physicians asking about travel and what do they need to ask about travel? Yeah, I think asking a patient about their travel and especially in times that they know that it's highly likely. And so we're in summertime asking people, oh, are you planning on going somewhere? Leads to that conversation of how you're doing for preparation. We will soon be out of summer and into holiday season and saying, oh, are you planning on traveling and seeing family during this time? And so creating that question creates opportunity for the discussion. This also brings up not only vaccinations about the traveler and what the family may need, but opens up those questions that I get often about what other vaccinations should those who we may be visiting have. A great ask that I always get when I'm around holiday season, around summertime is, hey, I've just had a baby. Does everybody I know need to have a Tdap or their pertussis, their whooping cough vaccination? And so I think having those discussions with your provider can help you find that answer. Um, my usual answer is anyone who's going to be really helping take care of an infant or be in high contact with an infant, you should feel open about asking about it. And I think that is another really important point. You should feel comfortable about controlling your own environment and finding your way of asking about how to be safe in whether it's out and about in public or how to be safe and controlling the contacts that you, uh, that you come by, even in your own family scenarios. Yeah, I love what you said last time we were talking, Horton. You mentioned don't be afraid to use either your pregnancy or your newborn as an excuse, right? Like, like assert that. Absolutely. Hey, if you're having to go through this pregnancy, you may as well give some bonuses from it because there's a lot of challenges that come with pregnancy and, and taking care of a newborn. And so feel free to utilize this. And even as your children grow up, I mean, you'll still have kids and you can use any of these excuses. You can help frame in a non-threatening way of, hey, we're coming by. My kids are often really sick. You know, is there anything that we need to worry about when we come to your household? Because it's also important to think that it's not just us getting sick but we bring things to other people. And so being mindful of also, if we're not feeling well, of giving yourself pause and acceptance of what may be fear of missing out or sadness of having to cancel travel. But if you're not feeling well, if you're febrile, if you're sick, you should really consider maybe not traveling. And so there's the flip side of this, being mindful of if you're in a place already before you travel, of being ill, you should consider staying home in your safe environment. But I definitely think you should utilize any ease you can of talking with family, talking with the restaurant, talking with the hotel of, hey, look, we're just trying to keep ourselves safe. Can you tell me about this? Yeah, great point. And that, that in our preparation and planning, we probably need to have an escape plan or a backup plan for those eventualities. Excellent. So you mentioned things that we could think about or conversations we could have with the people we might be traveling with. COVID's been on everybody's mind, but there are a lot of other things that are sort of risky or dangerous out there. What other things does this population, you know, the pregnant breastfeeding and traveling with newborn group need to be aware of? I think we're all kind of in this COVID bubble, so that tends to be the conversations that most of us have. But it's it's easy to forget that there are plenty of other things to think about. There are plenty of other respiratory viruses, too. It's not just COVID either. And so being aware of your surroundings, your environment, how people are feeling, how you yourself are feeling is important as well. Depending on where you're traveling to, there certainly are other sorts of diseases that we always like to consider, particularly in international travel, things like malaria, yellow fever, Zika um, is an important one in this population that we tend to talk about um, and haven't heard a whole lot about recently, just again in this COVID bubble. So those are all really important things to consider and things to talk about with your physician or your travel clinic provider prior to traveling. Certainly there are a lot of other scenarios. We like to talk about infections 
in certain scenarios being your biggest risk factor. So depending on where you're going, again, mountains, hiking, do you need to be thinking about ticks and other things like that? And this is where those discussions with your provider come in to play because they're going to be able to guide you on how to take appropriate precautions and safety measures, perhaps medications or vaccines if necessary. Excellent. And then Horton, there are some things that might be mild or people don't think of them as being a big deal, but that for pregnant women can be quite an issue, right? There can be. And towards Clayton's discussion, there are a lot of medications in our preparations like lotions or insect repellents that I have these conversations pretty consistently with my patients. And so things like it is okay to use insect repellents that have DEET. If it isn't comfortable for you, then make sure that you are using something that is a plant-based that does have good protection. And there are items and there are ways to protect yourself. Wearing longer clothing that covers your ankles as well as your arms from, a, from the travel and camping perspective that you can use besides using chemical barriers that are safe to use as well. When it comes to traveling into areas that have malaria, there are medications that we want to avoid preparatory for patients who are pregnant. The main thing to know is that there are safe alternatives for those who are pregnant for protection against insect-borne illnesses, as well as minor illnesses that you kind of pass back and forth. It may be a flu or it may be a common cold that may give you a fever. And one of the things as a pregnant patient you would want to consider is, as you'd mentioned, where would you go? Not all cities have a labor delivery. Not all cities have an obstetrician in them. You mentioned a really good point of what is your backup. And in this case, your backup is, if I'm pregnant, where would I go if I got sick? Getting a stomach flu or getting food poisoning. I am from Louisiana. You will get a bad oyster sometime. That is an infectious concern. And you not being able to stay hydrated is a really big deal when it comes to pregnancy. So where would I go is a part of those thoughts around if I get sick, especially for the pregnant patient. And I just want to let that lead right into something that I don't know anything about, and that's when does that also affect breastfeeding? When does that affect if I'm pumping? What do I need to be thinking about, or when do I need to be concerned that maybe I need to have an alternative for my baby's nutrition there? In general, there are very few things that you would need to stop from a transient illness that you would need to stop breastfeeding. So the good news is you can continue to breastfeed. And I always talk about this whenever we talk about breastfeeding and travel. You should feel comfortable breastfeeding wherever you want to breastfeed. I I feel like a person should be able to breastfeed in public wherever they want, but that may not be comfortable for the mother, the parent who's breastfeeding. I always talk about this, that the nipple is not dangerous. It will not make people go blind. And we have this, <laughs> we have this fear of, of breastfeeding in the nipple in the United States. But know that it is safe to breastfeed in general. There are very few things that are of transient infectious disease that are a problem. Even if someone were to get mastitis, keep breastfeeding. And so definitely, Clayton, you've got an expertise here that can add to this. I would totally agree with you. There are very few instances in which it's not okay to continue to breastfeed. Particularly, like John mentioned, it is not uncommon to get a GI illness, depending on where you go to, even here in the States, um, with seafood and things like that. And even then, it's really important to continue to breastfeed. And the most important thing for the mom is just continue to stay hydrated, right? And that's going to help as well. If for some reason there is difficulty with breastfeeding during an illness, making sure you have an alternative to feed your child, if that means it's formula somewhere, making sure that you have a safe and adequate water source, something like that. But in general, it is okay to continue to breastfeed during a mother's illness. Well, I'm glad to hear that, but I also want to put a plug in here for if you have a GI illness, Practice good hand hygiene when you're handling your baby and your breast. That's all. I totally agree. And the same with if you've got a respiratory illness, having masks around or ubiquitously in our bags is something very modern, a certain very new that has come with COVID to most of America. And so if you've got a cold, putting on that mask when you're in contact with your baby can help. And so doing your basic hygiene, if you were ill, 
while you're around your baby, cleaning your hands, having good hand hygiene, wearing your mask if you're ill can make a difference. All right, I want to ask a couple more things about this while we're in the idea of breastfeeding. First of all, talk to me about traveling with breast milk, traveling with breast pumps. It sounds like a really complicated idea. It can be very complicated and it can be a little bit intimidating at times as well. I first want to echo what John said is that you should be comfortable breastfeeding anywhere, right? And that can sometimes be difficult here in the States in crowded airports and things like that. Something to keep in mind is that there is a law in place that requires medium and large size airports to have dedicated rooms for breastfeeding that are not bathrooms. So keep that in mind as you're as you're traveling, that there may be a safe space for you to go that's a little bit more private as well. But if you are traveling with pump and pump parts and things like that, there's also a lot of considerations there. So I do want to say that for moms traveling with breast pumps and pump parts, your breast milk and the pump parts are exempt from standard liquid and carry on TSA regulations. And these are actually separate from your carry on luggage. Even this is an entirely separate thing. That said, you will find that some people recommend traveling with kind of still that three ounce bottle just to avoid any hassle, if you will, in going through security and such. In addition, they are technically not allowed to inspect your breast milk. They're not allowed to open it. They're not allowed to evaluate it. Some people do recommend traveling with these TSA regulations printed out in case you run into any difficulties as you're going into security. But these are all things to keep in mind because this can sometimes be a little bit challenging to go through security with all of this stuff. Yeah, I agree. And, and being mindful that if someone does tamper with any of your breast milk, if it's open, then that's something you should consider. That's when you toss out as painful as that may be. But if it's been opened and inspected, certainly touched in any way, that's something you should consider just not utilizing. With breast milk, Keeping in mind, are you going to be in a place or staying somewhere that you can keep your breast milk cold when you are pumping so that you can utilize it later if you so want? And then cleaning all of your breast supplies. What is the water that you're using? If you don't have the ability to actually boil or steam components themselves, know that this may be an instance that you want to use bottled water. If you're in a place that has good, clean water, totally feel confident using it. But this isn't the place I'm going to clean my breast pump parts in the lake. Like just because it's water and looks clean and pristine, not necessarily true. And so making sure that you've got good, fresh water that you know is safe, not just to mix with formula, but even cleaning the breast pump parts. Wow, I had not thought about that at all. But I know that in a lot of parts of rural America, we still have people in our wells and, you know, th th who knows what's going on with those w sort of water sources. That's really interesting. All right. We talked about a few of the infectious diseases that are sort of out there swirling around. And I know that masks have really helped keep down the transmission of some other respiratory pathogens that otherwise would have been running rampant through our population, whether that's influenza or RSV, which I know is a real concern with small ones. The other one that I'm hearing a lot about right now is monkeypox. Can we talk a minute about whether that's something that I need to put on my radar or what are y'all's thoughts on that? From a pregnancy standpoint, monkeypox can have an effect. It is certainly not as severe or impactful as some of the other pox-like illnesses like chicken pox or like certainly smallpox, which we should not come in contact with since it's eradication in general population. And so the main thing would be is if you were somewhere and you are suddenly developing an unusual rash, especially if it is a rash that has weak, little blisters, pus-like blisters, clear fluid, that is something that you've never had before. That's something you're going to want to contact your provider about. And there's a good point of how are you going to talk with your provider even if you're somewhere else? And so you may have the ability to talk with your home nurse practitioner, PA, physician, even if you're from afar. And so the main thing about monkeypox, it is rising. Uh, to give you an idea, there's been about 34, 3,500 cases outside of its usual endemic area worldwide. So the numbers are still fairly low. The other important thing to know is 
you have to have a pretty significant high contact to get monkeypox. This is not like COVID. If you're within six feet of someone, you might be in a contagious area. You're going to have to really physically interact with someone on a fairly intimate basis to be able to transmit this. So know that your fear of getting this should be pretty low because it does take such high contact, but it is always a good idea because there are a lot of things that are far more common, like even herpetic outbreaks, that may be actually having as much or a significant effect as well. So you'd want to contact your doctor if you have any new rash outbreaks, especially ones that involve blisters or open sores. Wow. So I'm thinking about traveling to see family. I've got this newborn and Aunt Sally has fever blisters or what we would have called fever blisters, right? Like, what do I need to be thinking about? I think that this kind of goes along with what we were talking about a little bit earlier and how to approach families or other close social gatherings with a newborn or, or with a pregnant woman in the context of, listen, myself or my, my newborn baby, we are susceptible to a lot of different infections. Our immune systems are not functioning like a normal, healthy person. So we're really trying to avoid people who are feeling ill. So if there is a form of a rash or a blister, I really don't want my new baby to come in contact with that and get that right now. So maybe when you're feeling a little bit more healthy and that goes away, you can cuddle them all you want. That's kind of how I would approach a lot of that. Yeah, setting house rules. Because it's probably not easy to say, hey, Aunt Sally, got any new rashes? I mean, that might invite conversations that you were not expecting. I think Clayton said setting just house rules of, if you're not feeling well, if you've got something going on, take a look at our lovely baby from afar. Aren't they adorable? That's sort of how you approach it. I think just laying those ground rules and realize that something like fever bristlers is something that normalizes in a person's life. They may not even think about it. And so you also need to have your own eyes on that. If you notice something, what would be your out? If you see someone who looks ill because they may have been wanted to be included and that fear of missing out may have driven them to come to that family gathering or that party, that if you see something that just doesn't seem right, what would be your out to say, hey, we need to go take a nap. Hey, we need to step away for a second and get some fresh air. I mean, so what would be your out if you feel like you're in a, in a scenario from concern of illnesses that you could escape? Yeah, I think having an ally and that plan is a great idea that you want somebody, whether that's your partner or another relative or friend, that can act as your backup, establishing those really reasonable borders around behavior. And you're right. I mean, we might be going to visit people that we haven't seen in a couple of years now, right? Or my baby's now a couple months old and nobody's seen them at all. And I know that people will be anxious to visit, but saying, hey, we really need to be super cautious right now. I appreciate you keeping your distance or keeping your hands to yourself, whatever it is, and having that out if things don't go my way. And that really brings up to me, like you mentioned, wanting to be in contact with your physician or your practitioner. What are the other times when I really need to touch base with them? Are there signs or symptoms or conditions or risks that it's past time for me to be able to treat myself or feel like I can successfully take a Tylenol or a Benadryl and, and get past and I actually need to get help? For the pregnant patient, this is a pretty easy list. If you've got fevers, which a fever to me is anything greater than 101.0 or higher, you should contact your provider. You can take Tylenol. Tylenol is safe in pregnancy. If your fever is persisting for more than an hour, two hours, certainly that's when you should maybe call for it and get advice. And then the real key is hydration here. If a pregnant patient gets really dehydrated, they will get sick very quickly and it can precipitate even into contractions. And so if you're having nausea and vomiting to the extent that you're not able to maintain hydration, you're not able to drink fluid, to keep yourself hydrated, that is a do not pass go scenario. Like you should seek medical attention at a local facility, if not also calling your provider for advice. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And I suppose right now in the heat that's just all across the country right now and doesn't seem to be abating, that's an especially high risk of dehydration. And then Clayton, are there times that that's something like in our 
newborn, you know, up to like one or two? Are there special things we should be watching for in that population? Certainly newborns, uh, especially within the first month or two of life, any fevers, I would contact your, your physician or baby's pediatrician as normal. As they get older, again, it, it kind of depends on how the kiddo is doing, maintaining hydration, persistent fevers, depending again on where you traveled, especially in various international locations, any fever really could be recommended to at least touch base with your doctor. And so those are really the biggest things that would be indications to, to contact your physician. Excellent. So if I get home from a trip and I'm sick within, you know, a week, two weeks of that travel, what information do I need to bring to my practitioner? Like when I'm going for that visit or when I finally decide I can't handle this by myself and I need to go, like as a practitioner, what do I need to be asking about somebody's travel when they're now ill, perhaps post-travel? There's a lot of good questions to ask to elicit risk of infection. Certainly location of travel, how long were you there? Who were you with? What sorts of food did you eat? Where did you get your water from? What was your water source? If, again, international travel, vaccination status, vaccination status really regardless, prophylaxis that was needed, things like that would be really important questions, I think, to ask. For the pregnant patient, I would also put into that list, I think right now, we think of shortness of breath, I think very much in the guise of respiratory illnesses. And though we're talking a lot about infectious disease and how to protect yourself, certainly the pregnant patient is more likely to get clots in general from either a febrile respiratory illness or just out of the blue without it. And so just from a provider standpoint, always keeping minds open about this might be a respiratory illness, this might be something else. And so just keeping your spectrums broad, your differentials large about does somebody have an infectious disease and what else could that have potentially triggered that now puts this pregnant patient or this person at risk? Wow. Yeah, that's a lot to think about. And really a lot of topics to think about today, right? So whether it's the preparation for travel and when I would time a vaccine or when I need to see my doctor ahead of time so I make sure I get all the right stuff together, making my way through public transportation and crowded airports and making sure I have good hand hygiene and my hand sanitizer ready, that I can safely navigate through TSA checkpoints with a breast pump or breast milk, and then navigating the minefield that might be my family, their family, friends we haven't seen who perhaps have a different threshold for sanitary kitchens and things like that. There's so many conversations here that we could be having, but I wanted to give you guys a chance to just tick through the things you really want people to come away knowing or thinking about when we leave them today. Clayton, you want to go ahead with your list? Absolutely. I think the couple things that I would keep in mind are number one, plan early. It's important to just consider and start to plan. Reach out to your primary physician, travel clinic if necessary. I would also, as Jill was talking about, if you're going to be around friends and family, making sure that you have a plan of attack, if you will, of how to approach difficult conversations, especially conversations if someone were to become ill. And those are kind of the, the big highlights that I want people to take away here. For you as a pregnant person, the main thing I want you to know is there are resources out there. There is the American College of OBGYN. We have a travel site, certainly for pediatrics, the American Association of Pediatricians. The CDC has a wonderful travel guide and very few things will get as detailed as they do on what things to be worried about from food and water supply and the vaccinations you would need if you're traveling to somewhere, especially within the tropical regions, about what are the things you need to think about before you leave. And most importantly, is you should feel totally and utterly empowered to control your environment, to protect yourself, protect those who you are being mindful for. And so looking towards, do I have the things to maintain like hand hygiene, to have masks and to control when I feel at risk, feel empowered to make sure that your environment is as safe as possible. Gosh, that's a great message. Thank you so much. 
I think that's just a really important note to get across. And I'm really happy to end on that idea of using this as an opportunity for empowerment, for making sure that your safe space is traveling with you and looking for those people that can help reinforce that if you need that. And really being able to use your baby or your condition as an excuse to just nope the heck out of a situation that doesn't feel so safe. Um, I think that's that's just great. So thank you guys so much. What a, what a pleasure to be with both of you guys today. I do want to mention that the resources Dr. Horton was just mentioning will be available as links in the podcast notes for today's session. So Dr. John Horton and Clayton Maurer, thank you guys so much for being with me today. It was wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's always great talking with y'all. For those of you listening at home, thank you for joining in today for this episode on travel guidance for pregnancy and breastfeeding. We hope you'll join us for future episodes on a wide range of topics from healthcare worker safety to personal protective equipment and more about infectious diseases of all kinds. If you have any questions for us, ideas for a future show or comments, please feel free to contact us at info at netech.org or you can find us on the web at netech.org slash podcast where you can subscribe to future episodes and find more information on today's topic. We'll see you next time on Transmission Interrupted. You've been listening to Transmission Interrupted, the podcast series from NeedTech, the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Learn more at needtech.org.